Okay, we're starting the study again on Isaiah 2. This will be the second and last part of this study. And uh, we're going to uh, do a little recap from where we left off last week, um, refresh our memories of what we studied and looked at there, and then we'll continue on with this one. So first of all, what we saw with Isaiah 2 was Isaiah the prophet, and of course that's God speaking through Isaiah the prophet, was speaking about the millennium age and, and some of the things that would be at that time. And um, it's, this is all purposeful. He has a purpose in doing this. He isn't just doing this so that we would know this. He has a purpose, and we'll see that purpose a little later on. And so he describes some things about the millennium age. And one of the things that he says is the mountain of the house of the Lord will be glorified and it will be raised. And from other scriptures, other places, we can see other references that indicate that there are going to be some really dramatic uh, earthquakes in that area and that it will in, in fact be raised in height somewhat. So it isn't just glorified, it's also raised in height. And uh, we looked at, at some of the topology of that area and things about that. And, uh, and it makes sense that it would be that way for other reasons too. So, but also he says the nations at that time will stream to it. And we studied that word and understood that as a sparkling cheerfulness as they go up to, to see God and to learn from God and to put the things that they learn into practice uh, in themselves. And so they, ha they have a wonderful attitude that they want to learn all of this stuff. And, um, and we know that these people who are going up there now at this time are the people who are non-believers. All the people who are believers now have new bodies and are in different uh, forms. But these people that are walking up to the temple are people who were non-believers when Jesus came. And so here's these formerly non-believers who are traveling up to the temple with sparkling cheerfulness and they're happy and glad to be going there. And uh, they say, teach us his ways that we might walk in them. So they have a wonderful attitude. And, and that's part of what the, the prophet is getting to here. Um, he's going to use that to speak to Israel. And so uh, he also says, though, that earth will be ruled from Jerusalem and, and everything will be uh, quiet. There won't be any wars anymore, won't be any fighting disputes, those sorts of things will all be gone. And uh, there's that verse that we've heard many times before about beating swords into plowshares. And there are other verses like that to talk about wolf with the lamb and things like that, um, talking about how things will be so much different than they are in the lives that we live right now. And so that's the first part of what we studied last week. But then he takes and turns and, and having talked about the millennial time and how things are going to be at that time, he starts speaking to Jerusalem and to Judah and, and saying, this is what they'll, they'll be like. And this is their attitude to, to God. And he says, come house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So he's saying to Israel, you really aren't like those people. You're different from them. You, you don't thrill to hear God's words. You aren't cheerful, bubbly like that to hear all of these things. Um, and so you're different from them, he says, and he continues on to say, your God has abandoned you because of what you're doing. And I, I didn't want to make a long list of all the evil practices here, but that's what I, Isaiah does. And he lists all of the things they're doing that are offensive to God. And, um, and among those, a lot of the things there are things that uh, of worshiping things that they've made with their hands. And we're going to see that theme come back here again uh, later on. So he, he uses that prophecy about the millennium and the future and how those people who were haters of God became people who are, are wonderful and bubbling and loving to learn about God and his ways. And he, he uses that and applies that to is Jerusalem and Judah of his time and saying, you really aren't like those people. And so having done that, now he goes back and starts talking about the millennial age again. And he, and he talks about one particular characteristic of them, and that is that as that millennial age began, all of them were humbled. Um, there was a time when they, they perceived the glory and the magnificence of God, and it crushed any lack of humility that they had, any arrogance that they had, any things like that. And he says, there was that time when they were humbled at the beginning of that age, and that's when Jesus comes and, and people perceive that glory of him and that wonderfulness and that power and all of those things that are part of him. And they realize what fools they have been and, and how uh, arrogant they've been in the lives that they've lived in rejecting him and, and just everything that they've done about their lives. And uh, they're humbled by that. And, and so he says those people went through that. And the message to Israel in that is that uh, for Israel's time is, um, or for Isaiah's time in Israel, 
um, he's, he's saying, your time is coming too. You're going to be humbled. Um, God is, is displeased with what you're doing. And there's more than one way to be humbled. The people in the millennial age are humbled when they see God arrive and, and understand his greatness and glory. But there's another way to, uh, to, to be humbled, and that is when God punishes people and, and uh, sets them back on their heels and uh, makes it clear to them that all of the things that they thought they were uh, great about and wonderful about are not so great and wonderful. And uh, so um, there's two ways to be humbled. And, and so Isaiah is saying it would be better if you humbled yourself. But if you don't, God is going to humble you for you. So continuing on, um, the prophet was uh, it gave a number of verses to indicate the idea that even the common man was too proud. We could easily imagine that there are proud people who need to be humbled. But even the most common man, uh, the average person, is too proud for God and, and too arrogant about who he is. And, and we tend to really think a lot of ourselves as humans. And we think a lot about the things that we've accomplished. We, we think that somehow mankind is wonderful because we're now in space and flying around in jet planes and stuff like that. Um, that kind of arrogance uh, does not please God in any way. And then we also spent a little time on uh, something else that the, uh, the prophet mentions. And he says, do not forgive them. And he's talking about those people in that millennial age. And we've talked about this in the Ezekiel study, and we, we talked about it last week as well. This idea that there, there doesn't seem to be any kind of system of forgiveness for them at that time. Um, if there is anything, it certainly isn't mentioned in the Bible. And so... What we see from these people that we talked about who are heading up to the temple in the millennial age, uh, they are sparkling, joyful, cheerful people desiring to learn God's ways and live in them. And apparently all of that without any promise of forgiveness. They're doing that only because they know that is the right way to live. And, and so, of course, it helps that God is there to show them that and show them his glory. It also helps that Satan is locked away and, and that makes it possible for them to, to stay on that path. And we know that that path does come to an end when Satan is loosed and all and starts to deceive all of the people again. But in any case, at that time, those people um, who had been against God are completely different than they had been before that time. OK, so starting today's study, we're going to look at a topic I've mentioned before. First, before we get into the verses. And that's the idea of a chiasm. I don't know if you remember, but I'm going to go through it again to make sure everybody understands this. God uses this chiasm idea in many, many places in the Bible. And he does it because he wants to highlight something. And that's what a chiasm is done uh, for. It, it is to uh, focus your attention on a particular part of the text um, and, and sometimes to associate different parts of the text together. And so um, the prophets didn't have highlighter pens at that time, so they couldn't uh, mark in red or yellow or green or something like that um, the specific parts that, you, that God wanted you to focus on. So God did it in an entirely different way. What he does is he, he uses a small text. It might be a single verse, or maybe even it's two verses sometimes. Sometimes it's that large. Uh, sometimes it's smaller, but it's a small piece of text that he uses before and after this text that he wants you to focus on. So th this highlighted text, if he had a highlighter, he would highlight it in yellow. But instead what he does is he puts this small text in front of it and then repeats the small text after it. And so if you're watching for that, you can say, oh, he seems to be repeating himself. Um, and, and, and then you look to see what he said before there and, and you can realize this is something you're supposed to see as, it can be a theme, it can be a, po a special point he wants you to understand. Or sometimes he's showing you relationships between things. So I, I put together a bit of an example here based on Dumbo the Elephant, if you remember that story from Walt Disney. So if the text was written this way and, and, and it said Dumbo was an elephant, and, and then later on it said Dumbo was an elephant, that would be a key that there's a chiasm going on here. And so what happens here is this becomes, let me get my pointer out here. Yeah, okay, here, uh, this one, Dumbo has many friends, um, is, would be the, big, or, or sorry, Dumbo was an elephant is the beginning of the outer chiasm. In this one, there's, gonna, there's two of them. There's one inside of another one. Uh, so Dumbo was an elephant begins it, and these things in here are what God wants you to see as something special, and, as kind of a point or a theme, as I was talking about. And then it ends with this phrase being repeated here. Now, this one is a two-level one, and that's going to be the same thing we're going to see in Isaiah here, is that it's uh, too deep. So inside of this outer chiasm, there's another one. 
So it, your text might start by saying Dumbo was an elephant, and then it would say maybe Dumbo had many friends, and that would be repeated later on. So we have that chiasm inside of another chiasm. And so uh, and if, that's the, if it's only two levels deep, then the text in here is really what God wants you to focus on. And so the real focus of this, what the author might be trying to tell you is Dumbo could fly. Okay, so that's the special thing. That's the point he wants you to understand, that Dumbo could fly. And so when we, we, that's our focus text. And then this one here closes that first chiasm. And that's followed by uh, another statement in here, uh, Dumbo had large ears. Now, this is still inside of a chiasm. It's inside of the outer one, but it's not inside of the inner one here. And so this text um, is related to this text. And, and what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to see and understand what the relationship is. How does it matter that Dumbo had large ears? How does that relate to Dumbo could fly? Well, it turns out that Dumbo can fly because it has large ears. So uh, in this um, fantasy world example, um, that's how um, chiasms work. And I hope you can understand that. We're going to be seeing another example in Isaiah. And, and there are many other places, even in the New Testament, where there are chiasms like that. And, and you can recognize them if you're kind of watching as you read and you say, boy, this text is awful repetitive. The same verses keep coming back and back. And this is very true of Isaiah. What we're going to see here is verses repeating themselves. And you'll see that structure where um, they are one is inside of another. So this one will start this way and then repeat. And it repeats inside of this one. It doesn't repeat down here somewhere. It repeats inside of it. So this is an inner one, and this would be the outer one. And these chiasms actually sometimes go very deep. Um, people have claimed that they found ones that go six and seven levels deep. I'm not utterly convinced of that. Um, sometimes they start using, instead of a, a phrase, they start using a word, and even not just a word, but a word that starts it, and a similar word, but not the same word that ends it. So. Um, I'm, I'm suspicious of that. Anything more than three seems to be unnecessary. But some people have claimed much more than that. So that's how chiasms work. And, and we're going to immediately run into that here in Isaiah 2. And so this is going to be the opening text of one of the chiasms. And so it, it says, this is uh, chapter 2, verse 10. Enter the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. So to start off, this is an idiom, and it, it appears in other places. It appears in Revelation, this same idea of hiding yourself, um, and not just hiding yourself, but hiding your evil self. It's really um, an idiom for being ashamed of what you have done uh, or said or whatever. And, and it, it appears that way, as I said, in Revelation. And if you've ever seen people kind of describe something they did and they maybe go cover their eyes a little bit like that, it's that same indication of, boy, I did something dumb and I'm really ashamed of what I did and I feel stupid about it. That's the idea here is that you feel so dumb about what you did that you wish you could run and hide someplace and, and no one would see you. And, and so they're talking about hiding, in this case, from the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. So now they've come to understand that uh, God is magnificent and splendor, splendiferous and uh, amazing and powerful and great and awesome and glorious and all that stuff. And, and so they realize how foolish they've been. And so, and, and they're ashamed of how foolish they've been. And so they want to run and hide uh, from the thing that is showing them how foolish they are. And, and that's, this is going to be that opening text. And so uh, the opening text is addressing this idea that we, mankind, generally think that we are something. And I talked about that just a moment ago with all of the accomplishments of mankind, or sometimes our own personal accomplishments. We can start to think that we are something as well. And, and um, But that is all crushed when we understand how great and magnificent and splend splendorous uh, is God. And, and when we see that, when we realize how great he is, we realize how little we are. And, and we're ashamed of all of our thoughts that we had about how wonderful we were. And we want to hide ourselves. So that's really what's being conveyed here. And as I said, this is the beginning of an, the outer chiasm. And the outer chiasm is traditionally called chiasm A. And, and the next one in would be B, and if there was another one, it would be C, and, and so on. So, so this is the opening to chiasm A. And we're going to see this uh, verse almost exactly uh, repeated. And, and this verse is going to highlight the text that's between them. So watch for that. I'll, I'll show it. I'll, I'll actually use some highlighting on the pages to show you the pieces. Okay, so inside of that is the next verse, which is Isaiah 2.11. The proud look of man will be abased, which means reduced or crushed. 
and the loftiness of man will be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So he's saying something quite obvious, is that uh, in that day when Jesus comes, uh, everybody who had any pride in them is going to be crushed and ashamed of, of the things that they've done. And after that time, no more will any human being be exalted by an, another person. It will only be Jesus who will be exalted. Nothing else, nobody else. Um, uh, all of mankind's current thinking about who is great and, and why they're great will be crushed and gone. And, and this verse, in, in addition to telling this, us this stuff that is important to know, it is also the opening for chiasm B. So this uh, verse is also going to be replayed, uh, repeated later on, and it's going to be repeated before the closing part of chiasm A. And that's part of how you know that there are chiasms involved, is that B ends inside of A just as it, as it began inside of A. I hope this is making uh, some sense to you. Um, so, okay, it, it highlights the text between the opening B and the closing B, and this is a two-level one, so B is as deep as it's going to go. And so, um, B is inside of A, and uh, and it or yeah, B is inside of A, and we're going to see the focus point right here, in the next verse. And so the focus point is this verse and the next one, which says, "For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty, and against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased." And remember, abased means reduced, crushed down, and and so. Um, He's talking about that day when Jesus comes and, and we see how wonderful he is and how small we are in comparison. And he says, a day is coming. Uh, that The bill for what you've done is going to come due. All of the pride you've had, um, you've been excessively proud of yourself, uh, proud of your people, proud of your accomplishments. All of that is going to be humbled by force uh, because you're going to be ashamed of the things you've done when you understand the truth of that and understand how arrogant you've been. And, and so, for, as I mentioned before also, Isaiah is giving this message to Israel of his time, and, he, and he's warning them that they're going to be humbled, not in the same way of Jesus coming, but they're going to be crushed by enemy forces that are sent by God, and, and they're going to be humbled in that way. So there's going to be uh, two humbles that are, are humblings that are talked about here. One is meant for Israel, and one is the one that happens when Jesus returns. Keep both of those in mind. Okay, so this is part of what's inside of the innermost chiasm. And the next verse that's in there is, are these two verses, or three verses here. And it says, And that day it will be against all the cedars of Lebanon that are lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, against all the hills that are lifted up, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the beautiful craft. Now, what happened there is suddenly, in the heart of this chiasm, Isaiah 2 turns into a symbolic description. Until now, this prophecy hasn't had any symbolism. But here, for this part, and only for this part, it starts using symbolism. So I'll explain to you what the symbols mean here. Trees are people, and, and the Bible uses that in many places. It also appears in Revelation. Trees represent people, and, and so great trees represent great people, so large trees. And at that time, they knew large cedars from Lebanon. If, if there are mentions of that in uh, David when he builds um, his house. Um, uh, the cedars he got, he got from Lebanon because they were the greatest trees available. And the oaks of Bashan were also great trees. And so the, these are used to symbolize great people. Um, and or people that we perceive as great people is really the message here. And he says all of these people, that, that day of humbling is going to come against all of these people who think they're something or people who think that the other person is something. So trees are people. Mountains and hills are special places. They're like religious locations, sacred sites that uh, mankind has created of their own. Um, and, and there were many of those false altars and stuff like that at that time in Israel. The high towers and fortified walls are referring to protection, um, and as in militaries or self-protection. If, if you believe that you're safe because you have a gun in your dresser drawer, you're not safe. And, and that's the idea there, is that all of the things you believe can bring you protection, can't bring you protection. Um, only God is, is your protector. And the reference to ships and beautiful craft uh, are, uh, are referring to works of our hands, things that we've built that we think we're wonderful because we built these things. And in our case, as I mentioned before, that's talking about 
um, the works of our hands being things we've created, aircraft, jets, uh, spaceships, all of those th sort of things that, that in so recent history we've um, managed to create. And, and all of these things that we think are wonderful and uh, great about us and great accomplishments of mankind are all nothing compared to God. And, and so this day is going to come all of the, to, against all of these things and crush them down to being what they really are, just ordinary trees and just ordinary people and things like that. So God isn't really against all of these things. He's only against where they are in our hearts. And, and that's the problem area, is that they, they shouldn't have a special place in our hearts, that, that, that's certainly not a place that, that drives God out of our hearts. And that's what had happened with Israel. Okay, so that ends the content of that innermost chiasm, chiasm B. And, and so here we're going to see the, the repetition of that verse that we saw that, that started chiasm B. And it says, the pride of man will be humbled and the loftiness of men will be abased and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So if you remember, we read that verse just, um, that was, I forget what verse it was, 11 it was. Um, so back at verse 11, it said the very same thing. It said, the proud look of man will be abased and the loftiness of man will be humbled and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So, so that's the end of that innermost chiasm. But there's another verse, I left it on this slide, uh, but it could have been on a separate slide. This one here that I've marked out in green is the um, is still in chiasm A. It's it's now outside of chiasm B because this is the ending of chiasm B here, and it is the entire content of chiasm B. So chiasm A had all of those verses that we looked, or chiasm B I should say had all of those verses that we looked at before, and this is the only thing that is left in chiasm A that it, that wasn't in chiasm B. I know this is complicated, but I hope you're getting some of it. Okay, and, and so this is, is that same kind of link that we saw in the Dumbo example. It, it means that what was said before in chiasm B is related to this message here, but the idols will completely vanish. And that doesn't seem like anything really special, but there's really a lot of special ideas involved in that. How does something vanish? If you are worshiping idols of stone or, or whatever, um, and, how does an idol uh, vanish? And, and when you think about it, really, the idol doesn't vanish. And, and um, it's something inside of you that vanishes. Uh, and, and so that's what you need to pull out of this, is what vanishes is the problem inside of you. So when, when you are crushed down, when you are humbled, um, and, and that seems to only ever happen by force, by God, so when you're humbled, all of a sudden these idols that you had vanish, and, and they were things that were inside of you. And, to, and so this little piece of, of text that I've highlighted here is something important, but something you need to think about, and it's related to what was in the other chiasm. And so what it comes down to is when pride is down to appropriate levels, and, and we all have a little bit of pride and the Bible even talks about that, that we need kind of a little bit of that, but we don't need very much of that. But once it gets down to the appropriate levels where it should be, the idols vanish. And the things that we thought were something special become only hammers and computers. They're no longer the gods that directed our lives or instructed us or taught us or anything that we had. They, were, they aren't the things that make us wealthy. And, and so going back to the examples from Chiasm B, it said, um, I talked about the trees and all those sort of things. So um, when pride is reduced down to the levels that it should be, those things that were great lofty oaks re representing uh, great people become just ordinary people. And they become ordinary places and ordinary walls and ordinary boats. And, and they lose that um, worship factor uh, that we had for them. And, and so the, the real message here is once your heart is humbled, you no longer desire idols. And so you don't create them. And, and any that you had just vanish because there's no room for you now. You, you, you've been humbled, and, and as a humbled person, you don't have any need for that. Okay, so now verse 19 uh, says, uh, and this is going to be a repetition of, we, of what we heard before. Men will go into caves of the rocks and into holes of the ground before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. Okay, so this is the same thing that we saw that opened, the same text that we saw that opened up chiasm A at the very start. 
And, and what it said, that was back in verse 10. And it said, enter the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. So you can see that um, that's the pretty much exactly the same, the same text. And so that's closing off chiasm A. And you would think that that would be the end of it, but it's not. Um, God actually takes this little bit of extra text here. When he arises to make the earth tremble, he tacks that on to this verse. And now this whole verse is going to repeat again in a new chiasm. So we, we had chiasm A before, and we saw that chiasm B came in, into it. And then chiasm B was closed off, and chiasm A is now closed off. But now there's a new chiasm A that's going to open up. And that has some more words that God wants us to focus on. Well, I hope you're getting this because I know this is tough stuff. <laughs> so, um, so what it says inside of this second chiasm A is, In that day, men will cast away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship. So because this is in this chiasm, we know it's, it's an important thing and, and there's value in, in studying it and understanding it. And it actually turns out that this is a humorous visual. It's, if you could draw illustrations in the text, you would make a little illustration to depict this scene of people throwing away idols to the moles and the bats. And the moles and the bats are important here. Moles, we don't have them around here, but a mole is a, an animal that lives underground almost exclusively, pretty much never comes up. It lives off of worms that it finds in the ground, and it lives off of tree roots that it finds in the ground, and it spends its life underground. And a bat is similar in that way. It, it spends its uh, daytime in caves, and it only comes out at night. So both of these animals essentially live in the dark all of their time. And so these people who are running around throwing away their idols are throwing them to animals that live in the dark and cannot see the glitter of the silver and the glitter of the gold. And so they're throwing away the things that were worth something to them before, but are now worthless to them. And they're throwing them to animals to whom they're also worthless. So it's, it's kind of comedic if you think of it that, in the right way. And so people had made idols to worship. And, and that's a second commandment uh, reference there. And so, but they make idols in themselves. And that's kind of the, the big point here is that when you create an idol, it's not the thing. It's what you've created inside of yourself. And, and so what another person sees as an idol, another person might just see as a book or, or a job or who knows what. Uh, we make idols out of all sorts of things. And, and, but when we make it an idol, we're doing that inside of ourselves. And we're doing that inside of ourselves because we're not as humble as we should be. And, and so when you are as humble as you should be, you won't do that kind of thing because you won't have any value for things like that. And so true humbling has that quality that you don't, search for idols you don't make idols of things and and so i'll just say something here um this will be tricky to understand but if you think about it uh, some i think it'll be good for you all idols are made of silver or gold and the reason is that's the value we give them and and so you can you don't think of them in that way but the we when we create an idol in ourselves we value it. We give it a value, a great value, silver, or gold, something like that. And so when, when we fall into idolatry that way, um, and I've seen examples of that, uh, kind of sad examples where people fell into that, um, you, you start to value a thing much more than it should be valued. And, and uh, you value it like it was important to your life, like it was silver or gold. And so in a sense, all idols are made of silver or gold, even though they might be made out of paper. Hope that makes some sense too. Okay, so um, now that chiasm. I wonder to say, Stan, that um, uh, it seems like we, we have a tendency as people to make idols out of everything. Oh yeah. You know, like you know, like the Bible talks about the idols of the world, the idols of the world, the idols of the world, and and they they may be religious in the human way, but then they idol without the God that really is. That they are something that they're not. So I, I think even like you know, football players or other sports figures, we make idols out of them for many mm -hmm. people. You know, yes. it's kind of sad that, but that's a solution to us to the kind of uh, world we're living in. Yeah, and more than that, it's the bodies that we live in. The bodies that we live in like um, to do that, um, and, it, and it might seem strange, but but we certainly do. Um, out of all sorts of things, as you're saying. 
Okay, so um, in this verse here, now remember we just um, had, um, had seen that verse about um, the effects of humbling, making things, um, making people throw away their uh, precious statues and whatever they had to animals that have no value for them. And, and that continues on here. And it says, they're doing all of that, they're throwing away all of those things in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. So a couple things are going on here. Um, first of all, that kind of comedic description that we saw previously um, is, is flowing into what's actually the closing chiasm for this. And so it's saying all these people are running around throwing away all this stuff so that they can go and hide. And, 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 and we see that hiding uh, verse again, the rocks and the clefts, uh, the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty is all repeated again here. And so it flows into the closing chiasm and that um, it, it, it was originally in verse 19 and it talked about the exact same thing, men will go into caves of the rock. I've read all that before. And, and so um, what is happening here is it's, it's, it's kind of doing two things. It's uh, continuing on with that comedic description and it's also closing this chiasm, chiasm A, the second chiasm A. Okay, and so now here we are at the final last verse. We're not in a chiasm anymore. We're, we're out of both of the chiasm A's and, and we're just in the last verse of Isaiah 2. And uh, so he summarizes really the whole of Isaiah 2. And he says, stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils, for why should he be esteemed? And so I, Isaiah is summarizing everything. Um, he says, Stopping having, stop having regard for man and the things that he has created or done. And man is nothing. His breath is in his nostrils. His life is fragile and it's easily lost. He has no value like that. And that kind of goes back to what Pastor was Joe, uh, Joe was talking about earlier about sometimes we start to value our bodies more than we should. And we can become um, idolaters of our own bodies, surprisingly. Um, so... Um, his point is, why should a person who can die, die so easily and who has no eternal existence be valued at all? And so the only thing that should be valued should be God, whose existence is eternal. And, and uh, so this is a good message for all of us to keep in mind, of course. I hope we aren't falling into uh, idolatry, but it is such an easy trap to fall into, um, as we've talked about, about so many things. And, and really the message here that we saw in the very core of the, the first chiasm is humble yourself or God is going to humble you. It's going to be that way. Um, that's your choice. So we'll summarize this uh, quickly and be done. So he, God says the day is coming when the glory of the Lord will be known and everyone is going to be humbled. And, and so the more arrogant you are, the more harsh that day is going to be on you. And, and um, so and the more humble you are, the easier that day will be on you. And so at that time, all of the arrogance, all of the idols that they have, all of the um, idol, idols that they've created for themselves with their own hands, all of those will vanish and they will be ashamed of what they've done when they see the truth of, of God and what God is and how much greater God is than any human. And, and so that humbling is going to come um, for everybody, the great and the small. And humbling is... Um, humbling yourself among people is a start, and that should be something that we should try to be. We should try to be humble among all of the people on this earth. Um, but humbling ourselves before God is really the goal. And, and that's a true humility that's very difficult to achieve. It's so much against our, our nature. Even being humble among people is difficult for many people. But it's so important to us because humble people will not do a whole bunch of things that we see people doing. They won't reject sound teaching. And that's a kind of an interesting idea. If you are humble, you won't reject what the Bible says. And so to reject what the Bible says shows that you have an arrogance inside of you that you need to deal with. You won't be twisting scripture uh, to make it suit yourselves, or you won't be searching around for twisted scripture that suits yourself. And, and so, you. yes. Can I say something? Can yes. I interject here? Thank you. So this is wonderful what you're going through right now with your family and your situation. Um, that people reject sound teaching, okay? The twisting of the scripture to suit themselves, right? But I also see that so much. Um, and I think it's, it's a perverse thing that the enemy you know, sold man um, into believing that we rejected as a society, you know, the, the Bible and the teaching of, of God and his word. Because I've noticed that even people 
I know, so you could be telling them what the Bible teaches of, and they're saying, well, you know, this is what, you know, Dr. So-and-so says this, yes. or our science says this, yeah. and, you know, and, and it, that's just, oh my gosh, it drives me nuts, <laughs> but it's, it's something that they internally believe, it's like it's running through their veins. Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and, and I've said that many times, too, that people will do that. And, and part of the problem there, maybe all of the problem, is rooted in an arrogance in themselves that they can find something better, that, that the Bible isn't satisfying for them, and they need to find something that, that works or better for them and, and suits them better. And yeah, that's what they do. Um, there are lots of false teachers out there and lots of false teachings to choose from, and people will go around looking for them. They don't consciously do that. And I kind of made a comment last week about that on, on our uh, page. Um, they, they do it in a kind of a subconscious way. They aren't so much aware. They, they don't tell themselves, I need to go out and find a pastor who teaches me what I want to hear. But they just go around searching from pastor to pastor until they find one that teaches, that tickles their ears and, and teaches them what they want to hear. So, yes, it happens all the time, and it's kind of sad. But it comes about because you haven't humbled yourself. You you think that you yourself can find something better than what the Bible is teaching. And so another thing that humble people will not do is they won't lie or steal or break any commandment because that's a lack of humility. Um, it is saying I'm better than the commandments. I can I can do whatever I want. Uh, I will I will live the way I want. And another thing that humble people won't do is they won't justify mistakes that they have made. We, we all make mistakes, uh, for sure that happens. And, and when we do, uh, we need to not try to justify them. And by justifying them, I mean things like saying, well, he deserved that, and, and, and so that makes it okay. And, and so we shouldn't be doing that sort of thing. Then a humble person won't do that, won't think that way. And so a humble person will also not worship pastors or athletes. This is the same list that Pastor Joe was uh, giving us, movie stars, mus musicians, politicians, whoever it is. Um, if you're humble, you just don't have any room for those kind of idols. You don't have any room for thinking that people are better than that. And, and that's a, a really with pastors, that's a problem for us um, as Christians, because we hear God's message coming from the mouth of a human being. We can often start to mix those together and start to think it's the human being giving us the message. But we need to recognize that the human being is just a human being and he has all the flaws, all the issues that we have and, and have to deal with. So that's the summary and, and conclusion here. Um, and there's lots more that humble people will not do. I didn't make a big list there. But the, the real message here is stop regarding man. Start, stop thinking that man is something special. Stop thinking that the, thing he has, the things he has done are somehow special and great and, and wonderful and glorious. They aren't. Um, everything that man does is nothing compared to God.